Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday morning to you. Welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardenwood, Oklahoma. And we are concluding our study of the Olivet Discourse. I've been summarizing what we have seen during our extensive two-year-long study of the Olivet Discourse. We're getting ready to go into a study of the feast days. And like I said yesterday, boy, that's exciting. Uh, I, I don't know, be honest with you, I don't know that I can do justice to this. I, I spent well over five years during the research for my brand new book, uh, Resurrection Feast Fulfilled, a study of the relationship of Israel's last feast day, i.e. Sukkot and the resurrection. So I spent five years over studying for that which meant I did not delve into the previous feast sufficiently. So uh, you might have to be a little patient with me here. And by the way, <clears throat> if, if those of you who are watching, who have been anticipating this study on the feast days, okay, uh, if you have some really, really, really good resources that I can study to understand the feast days, and their typological significance, feel free to send me. You can comment on it. Pardon me. You can comment on it on my YouTube. You can send me an email, just whichever would uh, fit best. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, I've been buying books, okay? Uh, one of the problems that I've been having is so many of the books do not give good historical documentation. So I want good historical, scholarly documentation for what people say about the significance of the feast days. Because I have found so far uh, in my research that I've been doing already, I find that some of the claims by some people about, oh, well, the uh, this feast day represented this, this feast day symbolized that and foreshadowed that, and they don't give a single footnote. They don't give a single bibliographic uh, reference. And come find out, I read about, uh, I find scholarly material on it. And I find out that the claim was not really accurate. Okay? Well, I want to be accurate. So like I said, if you've got some really, really good material on the feast days with good documentation, citations, you know, g give me the ancient sources. Give me the commentators. If if you are a person that digs into the scholarly literature and, and can find PDFs, for instance, on the subject of the feast days, uh, Robert Cruikshank, are you listening here? <laughs> uh, Robert Shank's my great friend, and I call him my PDF guy okay, has a, an incredible ability uh, to find PDFs, scholarly PDFs uh, on the different subjects. I, I owe him a great debt of gratitude, for instance, for the production uh, and the material that is in my book on the resurrection feast fulfilled. I mean, God just did, did a great job finding resource material for me. So if you're like Robert, you like to dig into the literature, the scholarly stuff, send me that information. I, I absolutely love it. I can't wait to get into it. Now then, back to Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following. What do we find? Well, as we've already seen, we have the coming of the Son of Man, which if it is the coming of the Son of Man of Daniel chapter 7, 13 and 14, it had to have taken place in, within the days of of the Roman Empire. You see, Jesus came to fulfill the old law. He wasn't giving new prophecy. <laughs> I'll never forget, in, <clears throat> in one of the books I've written, I made the comment, there is no new eschatology in the New Testament. All New Testament eschatology is simply the reiteration of, the expansion of, the exp explanation of Old Testament prophecies given to Old Covenant Israel. Well, <clears throat> one debate opponent, a Church of Christ minister, 
said, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. Can you believe that? And, and mind you, he was appealing to an audience of almost 300 people, ministers, who had never heard the concept that I had stated. So to them, as ministers in the Church of Christ who believed that God was through the Israel at the cross, God was through the Old Testament at the cross, and beginning on Pentecost, God began dealing strictly and solely with the church, yeah, that my statement sounded shocking, sounded revolutionary. Well, when I got back up in response to this pre preacher, and I put up chart after chart after chart in which the New Testament writers, all Jews, quoted from, cited, echoed the Old Testament prophets concerning the coming of the Lord, the judgment, the resurrection, and the new creation, uh, he didn't utter another word of ridicule about that. So when Jesus predicted his coming as the Son of Man on the clouds of heaven, then guess what? Since the only Old Testament prophecy that uses... <coughs> that uses the terminology of the coming of the Son of, Man, Son of Man on the clouds of heaven with the angels is Daniel 7. We're on pretty good ground believing that Jesus was citing Daniel 7, which once again puts Matthew 25, 31 and following in the days of the Roman Empire. Point number two is coming with the angels that we talked about yesterday. Well, guess what? Jesus was emphatic. His coming with the angels <coughs> in judgment was to be in the lifetime of the first century generation. Matthew 16, 27, Matthew 26, 64. Now we come to the third point that I want to examine, and that is it's the coming of the Son of Man with the angels on the clouds of heaven in judgment. As I pointed out yesterday, in the Churches of Christ Fellowship in which I was raised, the standard operating position, paradigm if you please, is that Matthew 16, 27, coming of Christ in judgment, is different from Matthew 16, 28. Now there are a growing number of ministers in the Churches of Christ that now recognize that verse 28 is AD 70, they're abandoning the view that I was raised with that verse 28 is the day of Pentecost. <clears throat> the traditional argument is Christ came into his kingdom, and notice the dichotomy, by the way. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Matthew 16, 27, a literal, visible, fleshly coming of Christ at the end of time. Verse 28, the coming of Christ, the coming of the Son of Man, invisibly by means of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Not in judgment, but in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's what I was raised with. But the point of fact is, ladies and gentlemen, in the New Testament, the coming of Christ for judgment is the coming of Christ in his kingdom. Now, I understand very well that the day of Pentecost was the initiation. We could even use the terminology of the birth of the kingdom, although there are certainly passages prior to Pentecost that says, you know, the kingdom was already in breaking. <clears throat> but the day of Pentecost was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to raise Israel from the dead and I don't even know the proper terminology sometimes, okay, because Jesus said, if I by the, by the finger of God do cast out demons in, in the book of Luke, then surely the kingdom of heaven has come upon you. Now, that may be prolepsis. That may be him saying the kingdom is about to be established, just, just, just like John said. Matthew chapter 3, the kingdom of heaven is drawn near. So we can't draw a hard, fast line and say, oh yeah, the kingdom had already been established prior to Pentecost. <clears throat> but again, here's the point. The coming of Christ in judgment is the coming of Christ in his kingdom. In the consummated form 
of the kingdom. When he, after having been, or after having gone into the far country, there to, you know, receive the kingdom, what would he do? He would come back to judge. Kingdom, judgment. Kingdom, judgment. And remember, as we proved this week, Matthew 16, 27 cannot be divorced from Matthew chapter 28 grammatically because verse 28 begins with, I mean, legal, who mean in the Greek, that little Greek term is used something like 88 times, if I remember correctly, in the New Testament, mostly in the Gospels. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen, it never breaks the subject. It never changes the subject. Amin legal humin is always said to draw attention to what is about to be said that's going to emphasize what has just been said. That means that verse 28 is emphasizing verse 27. And verse 28 is telling us by emphasis that verse 27 would be, there are some standing here which shall not taste of death, until they see the Son of Man coming. These are not two radically different applications and uses of the coming of the Son of Man. Watch this. Pardon me. Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following. The Son of Man shall come with his angels. Then shall he sit on the throne of his glory. Wait a minute. He shall come and sit on the throne of his kingdom. The throne of his glory is the throne of his kingdom. So here's the coming of the Lord. Here's the kingdom. Well, what's next? All nations will be gathered before him. Some go to the right, some go to the left. Judgment. So here's Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following. That is the coming of the Son of Man with his angels to judge in his kingdom. And by the way, in the Olivet Discourse, which Matthew 25, 31 certainly is that, but even prior, what do we have? The coming of the Son of Man with his angels to gather together the elect. Is that the judgment or not? Well, of course it's the judgment. And in Luke chapter 21, 25 and following, the Son of Man will come. Son of Man will come on the clouds with angels in the judgment. And the Lord says, when you see these things, then know the kingdom of heaven is drawn near. Son of Man coming, angels, judgment, kingdom. Second Timothy chapter 4. Verse 1 and 2, Paul writing to Timothy, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is about to judge. Okay, judge who? The living and the dead. That's the resurrection, isn't it? Oh, wait a minute. We're told that Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following is the time of the resurrection. Well, that's true. Well, guess what? the coming of the Son of Man on the clouds of heaven with his angels to judge every man, that's the resurrection. And that's verse 28. Some standing here which shall not not taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, okay? Back to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is about to, from the Greek word melo, in the infinitive, and the blast de Bruner, Greek-English lexicon, grammar, says mellow with the infinitive means about to be, to be on the point of. Robert Mounts, a noted Greek scholar of the modern day, he's got a website. Look up Robert Mounts' blog on, on the Greek. Under mellow, it means about to be, to be on the point of. So the Son of Man is about to come in his kingdom and judgment. Judgment coming. 
kingdom. Folks, there is no dichotomy here. Matthew 16, 27, 28, that generation, which means Matthew chapter 25, that generation. 2 Timothy chapter 4, 1 and 2, it was about to happen. And finally, Revelation chapter 11, in the judgment of that city, the great harlot city called Babylon, which was to be destroyed at the coming of the Lord out of heaven, riding on a riding on a white horse, accompanied by the angels of heaven. At that destruction of that city where the Lord was crucified, Revelation 11, 8, what do we find? A great voice in heaven says, O Lord, you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. Oh, begun to reign? You mean to tell me the Father didn't begin to reign? until the coming of the Lord and the judgment of Babylon. See what I mean? Hebrew idiom. You have taken your great power and have begun to reign. <clears throat> now to reign, that's kingdom. And it is the time of the dead that they should be judged. That's resurrection. That's Matthew 25. That's Matthew 16, 27, 28. That's Matthew 24, 31. Yeah, Matthew 24, 30 and 31 is resurrection, folks. Can't develop that now. And the time of the prophets that they should be rewarded. That's resurrection. Once again, when would that be? At the judgment of the city where the Lord was crucified. Folks, this is absolutely beautiful. Look at all the connecting dots. There is an unbroken chain of testimony concerning the coming of Christ as the Son of Man to sit on the throne of his glory in judgment and resurrection. And in passage after passage after passage, we are told it was about to take place. It would be in that generation. <clears throat> it would be while some of those people who were hearing Jesus speak those words were still alive. I'm out of time. Hope you'll join me this Friday as I continue responding to the critics. And also, Mike Sullivan and I will continue our review, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, of the recent debate between Dr. Michael Brown and Steve Gregg. You don't want to miss that. Okay? I'll see you there.